so Philippians chapter 4, I'd entitle this uh, chapter, Closing Commands and Parting Promises. Closing Commands and Parting Promises. And really what we just see here at the end of the book is, you know, Paul is just making kind of this litany of statements here. There is a bit of a, you know, a, a vein that runs through it. It kind of ties everything together. We'll look at that at the end. But really it's just kind of these, you know, these seven different commands as well as a few of these promises that are mixed in there that Paul gives here to the Philippians at the end. And I just want to go through tonight and just kind of examine these quickly and just kind of Paul, apply some of what Paul uh, commands and his statements uh, in this chapter. And he issues these, these commands and he, and he shares a few of these promises. And I think that these are applicable to us today. And they offer us, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of comfort that can be found if we obey these things. And let's just jump into it there in verse 1. It says, Therefore, my brethren... Dearly beloved and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. <clears throat> so he's starting out real quick, you know, just expressing a lot of his just, uh, you know, heartfelt love for the Philippian people. And, you know, that's a very genuine thing coming from Paul. And it shows us that, you know, when you invest in people, you know, that's the kind of thing that, that that's how you should feel about the people that you invest in. You know, this is just real quick. You can't read that because he doesn't, he doesn't always lay it on that thick with a lot of the other churches. I mean, it's, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and long for, my joy and crown, my dearly beloved. I mean, he's just, he's really, you know, expressing his feeling for the Philippian people. But he tells them there to stand fast in the Lord, stand fast in the Lord. And that is a frequent command in Paul's writings. That is something that we see him tell church after church to stand fast in the Lord. If you would, keep something there, go to Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5. So what does it mean to stand fast? I mean, if Paul, you know, is saying to the Philippian people, you need to stand fast in the Lord, what does that mean? Does it mean get up out of your seat real quick? Stand fast, right? <laughs> I mean, that's kind of what it sounds like. Right? It's not an expression that we use a lot today. But Paul uses it repeatedly to stand fast. What does it mean? Well, it means, you know, if we were to actually look it up in the dictionary, it just means a rigid, unyielding position. To stand fast. You're just rigid. You're unyielding. You're a bulwark. Okay, you're not going to be moved. You're going to be steadfast would be another way of saying it. Unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. And an example that we can kind of get an understanding of what this means is, you know, is the fact that God's word stands forever, doesn't it? It will not fail. The Bible says in Psalms 111, the works of his hands are verity and judgment. All his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever. They're rigid. They're unmovable. They're unyielding. They're not going to give way. They're not going to give ground. They're not going to compromise. That's what he's saying when he tells them to stand fast, to be like God's word, to stand forever, to not yield. And, you know, here's the thing about that. We need to learn to stand for what really matters. And there's a lot of people today, they stand fast, don't they? But they stand fast for the wrong things. They take a, you know, they're a bulwark for some cause. And look, I'm, I'm saying even noble causes, causes that I would say, yeah, that someone needs to do that. Causes that I'm glad there's other people out there fighting that, that battle. But, you know, there's certain things that only, there's certain battles that only we as God's people can fight. And those are the battles that we need to fight. Those are the areas that we as God's people need to stand fast in and let other people fight these other battles, these worldly battles, these affairs of this life. Let them fight these other causes, even the noble ones. We are to stand fast for what truly matters and what truly matters, the faith. And we had to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. <clears throat> You're there in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. It says, stand fast, there it is again, therefore in the liberty where Christ hath made us free. You know, people get real, they want to stand fast for liberty when it comes to things like the Constitution and you know, even things like civil rights. And look, those are noble causes. Those are good things, aren't they? But what are we called to stand fast in? The liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. We're to stand for that faith and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Go over to Jude chapter 1. Jude chapter 1. He said in 1 Corinthians 16, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. He said in verse 3 of Jude 1, Beloved, and I give all diligence to write unto you the common salvation. It was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the Second Amendment, for religious liberty, for 
not wearing masks in the supermarket, to, to stand against the vaccine. Look, I'm for all those things. But he told us to earnestly contend for the faith. That's what we need to focus on. That's where we need to stand fast is in the faith and not get so wrapped up in all these other things that aren't going to matter in a thousand years, aren't going to matter when Christ finally comes back. He's going to come back. Well, what'd you do? Well, I stood fast. Really doing what? Uh, <laughs> wasn't for the faith. I mean, fill in the blank. You decide. If it's not in the faith, if it's not for Christ, what does it really matter? Now, again, I'm not against you know, the fact that there are people that are out there doing that. I'm glad that they are because that frees me up to stand fast to what really matters, the faith. <clears throat> Which was once delivered unto saints. Let the world fight the worldly battles. We are the ones that are supposed to stand fast in the faith. That's what Paul told the Philippians, to stand fast in the place, in the faith, in the faith. Now, in order to do that, he kind of gets into this idea of unity again. And if you remember, this was something that was kind of a bit of a theme throughout Philippians. In fact, it's a theme throughout the entire New Testament. Go back to Philippians. If we are to stand fast as one body in Christ, if we're to stand fast as a local New Testament church for the faith of Christ to go out and fight the spiritual battle that we've been called to, there needs to be unity within the local church. And Paul starts to address that a little bit here. He says, only let your conversation, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of you here, verse 20. You in Philippians 1? Can I have you go there? He didn't go there. He went to Philippians 4. Go to Philippians 1. He said, only let your conversation, verse 27, be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So what is it that we are to stand fast for? It's for the faith of the gospel, to stand fast in the faith. How do we do that? By being in one spirit, by being in one accord with one mind, by striving what? With one another? No, by striving together for the faith that was once delivered to saints. Go back to Philippians chapter 4. And he kind of, you know, I don't know who these ladies were, but they kind of get a mention. And you say, how do you know they're ladies? Because they're squabbling. <laughs> it's a harmless joke. I beseech you, I, uh, Euodius, and I beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind. Now, this can happen with anybody in a church, can it? That they can kind of get at odds with one another. They can, one can do one dirty, or they don't like something about the other one, and the next thing you know, they're at odds. They're not striving together. They're striving with one another. And Paul kind of singles them out here and picks on them a little bit. He says, I beseech Euodius, and I beseech Syntyche, that they be of the same mind, in the Lord, that they need to focus on what really matters, to be of the same mind. This is that call to unity that we see so often in Scripture. And not just, you know, a call, again, to any unit, unity in what? And unity in the Lord, specifically. We can, you know, we can disagree on a lot of different things, can't we? You know, we don't all have to come in here and agree on everything to get, you know, there's, we can have areas where we differ. We can have different opinions about different things. But there's one, you know, on, on certain doctrines, on biblical issues, there's no room for division. Now, obviously, there's going to be different interpretations. There's going to be subtleties, you know, peripheral doctrines in Scripture that, you know, we can talk about and have different opinions about. But there are the core tenets of the faith that everyone has to be on board with. You know, things like, oh, I don't know, the virgin birth. <laughs> you got to believe that, you know. If we're all going to be have one faith, if we're all going to be the same mind in the Lord, you know the resurrection, uh, you know the the substitutionary atonement of Christ, the Trinity, the you know the preservation and inspiration of God's Word, the literal uh, you know uh, interpretation of the biblical account. You know there's certain things that we all have to have the same mind in the Lord, if we're going to accomplish, if we're going to strive together for the faith, we have to be of the same mind in the Lord. <clears throat> the Bible says, well, go over to, we'll just move along here for sake of time. I got a lot of notes. But he says, if we're, if we're going to stand fast in unity, not only are we going to be the same mind, not only are we going to put maybe some of our differences aside, you know, maybe there's some things that we, all, we have feel very strongly about, but we, we differ on. Maybe there's some issue that, you know, we uh, differ on with another church member, you know, is if it's not a biblical thing, you can check that at the door and leave it there. Because again, that's not what we're striving here for. That's not 
the thing that we're uh, striving together for. If it's, not a, if it's not a matter of the faith, you know, you can just leave that outside or not make it a point of contention with another church member. You know, well, they, they voted for Trump. Well, they didn't vote. Well, I don't know if I can go to church. I mean, that's stupid. You know, but that's, what, that's a difference, right? That's, that's something people could, you know, not be, they could get at odds with one another over things like politics or whatever. There's all kinds of things that people can, you know, disagree about. But when they come into the house of God, you know, we all have to be the same mind in the Lord. We all have to agree, well, you know what, I might not agree with your take on politics. I might not agree with this issue or that issue. But when it comes to the Bible, you and I, we agree. We, ought, we, we share the same mind. And because of that, we have that unity. And now, even though we have these differences outside about worldly matters, we can still strive together for the faith. We can get something done for God. <clears throat> Not only are we going to, if we're going to stand fast in the unity, uh, we have to do so by being united. We have to also do what? Help those who labor in the gospel. You know, we have to be of the same mind, but then we also have to be willing to help in the labor of the gospel, okay? You look there in verse three, it says, and I treat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel. You know, and this is just kind of a sub point, but you know, this is a great verse about the fact that women can do great things for God. Help those women which what? Labored with me in the gospel. You know, not, you know, what was her name, Cindy? Sorry, Pastor Cindy. We met Pastor Cindy out soul winning today. The pulpit's not for you, okay? Because it has to be the husband of one wife. You know, run of these ladies all the time out soul winning. Oh, my aunt's a deacon. Yeah, it is, she got her wife in subjection? <laughs> Who? You know? Well, I'm, I'm pa- oh, of course I'm going to have him. I'm a pastor. Pastor Cindy. <laughs> really? You got your wife in subjection? Okay. You know, but that's, that's, you know, they make that, that's the only thing. If you're not behind the pulpit, you can't serve God. Is that, is that, is that true? Of course not. And he says here, help those women which labored with me in the gospel. With Clement also with my feather, other fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Look, they're getting the recognition that really matters, not just some title in front of their name. They're getting the fact that the, the recognition they're getting is the fact that their name is written in the book of life. You know, Clement here, you know, she got a shout out from Paul, not because she, you know, got some Cracker Jack ordination from some bozo, but because she labored in the gospel, because she contended for the faith. She went out there and did the work that needed to be done. But if we're going to have unity, if we're going to strive in the, for the faith, if we're going to stand fast, we need to be in unity and we need to help those who labor in the gospel. And how do you help the most? By participating by participating. You want to help in the labor of the gospel? Participate in the labor of the gospel. Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. If we're following Christ, you know, we are going to be fishers of men. That is the natural progression of following Christ. It's not a maybe. Christ didn't say, follow me and I'll make some of you a fishers of men. And some of you can just not. No, he said, I will make you fishers of men. Help by participating. Help by praying. I mean, Jesus said, pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth labors into his harvest. And help by not criticizing. You know, and this is something maybe for the one who is participating. You know, the one who is going out, who is laboring in the gospel. You know, help by not criticizing. You know what? By not criticizing others. We don't want to slow down the work for God out of just by criticizing one another. And I see this, you know, I've seen this, you know, I'm not, not just here. I've seen this in other places where people will start to critique somebody and nitpick and start to pull them apart. And I have to ask myself, why? What, what good are you accomplishing? You know, and, and I get it. Sometimes people have eccentricities about the personality. They do things differently. And sometimes people do need to be told, hey, don't do that. Do do this. Or maybe just kind of bring it to their attention, like, you know, let me just get real specific. You know, I saw and this, I saw a guy, I don't have an invite on me, but, you know, it's, I started seeing it happen to several soul winners 
they take they go to those ring doorbells. And if you do this here, I'm not, you know, I've, you know I'm not just picking on you. I'm picking on several people. <laughs> but they go to those doorbells with the camera on it, and then they hold the invite right in front of the camera. And it, it, you know, I saw that a long time ago, and it bugged me. Every time I saw it, I said, man, that bugs me. I, don't, I wish they wouldn't do that. But you know what? I didn't say anything. So whatever. At least they're out here, you know, trying, knocking the door. I mean, I wouldn't do that, but what do I know? Maybe, maybe people would read that and go, I wasn't going to go to the door, but now that you're covering it up with the invitation, I am going to go to the door. <laughs> Stranger things have happened. I don't know. It could be the, it could be the case. You know, but then I've heard that, but then I've heard people start to say, oh, I can't believe, you know, that everyone's doing this and we got to do something about it. It's like, well, why don't you just talk to that person and just nicely say, you've ever thought about not doing that? <laughs> I mean, and, it, you know, and I was out with somebody who did that and they did that. And I went, what are you doing? <laughs> In a nice way. I wasn't like, what do you think you're doing? Give me that invite. You're done. Get out of here. You can't soul win. Who do you think you are? I just kind of smiled and said, what are you doing? And so I, I said, do you think they're reading that right now? And they're like, they did like this, and then they turned it over. <laughs> I said, they're going to read it when they take it off the door. Well, maybe they're reading it right now. I said, they're not reading it right now. Right now they're going, they're trying to see you. They want to see who is at their door, and they're mad. And the person told me, they were like, uh, they're like I was doing it the other day. And the lady said, knock it off or get that out of my face or something like that. I said, well, isn't that a, a clue that you shouldn't do that anymore? And you know what? That person said, you know what? I'm not going to do that anymore. And it wasn't because I was just like, oh, uh, whatever, you know, got some kind of an attitude. I just politely said, you know, probably not a good idea. And I said, if you want to keep doing it, go ahead. I'm not telling you not to do it, but I'm not going to do that. That's the whole point of the camera. They want to see who's at the door. It's kind of suspect when you're, you know, I mean, what's the difference between you just putting your thumb on it? You know, who is it? Come and see. Come out, come out wherever you are. You know, it's creepy. People, it's, it's frustrating. But here's the thing. We don't want to just start criticizing everyone and nitpicking every little thing that they do. I would have turned to that scripture. That's not how I would have led. Because ultimately, who, who, you know, how do people get saved? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, and it, does it really matter if, the, if somebody's just super polished and just has it just down to an exact science and just, is just the smoothest talker? No. Sometimes that can actually detract. You know, maybe that from, from the, the effectiveness of giving the gospel. Someone might just say, well, this guy's a real smooth talker. This guy's a real, he's got a good pitch going. You know, it's not, they might not come across as genuine. But when they see somebody who's trying, someone who has you know, a heart for it, somebody who's maybe struggling a little bit to get it, to go through the gospel, you know, that might actually speak to that person a little bit more. They might say, wow, this person cares so much. They're coming here and they're stumbling through this. And I can tell it's difficult for them, but they care so much that they're still trying. And God can use that. So let's not just criticize everybody for every little thing that they do out soul winning. Don't, you know, jump down people's throats just because they're a little different. You know, people have different personalities. People have different, ex, you know, eccentricities. And I'm glad for it. Wouldn't it, it, it would be, be boring if everybody was exactly the same. I'm glad that we have different personalities and, and people do things differently. It's, it's great. And definitely don't criticize soul winning itself. Look, if you don't want to participate, you don't want to pray, just, you know, at the very least, don't be one of these people that criticizes soul winning you know, either out loud or in your heart, you know, and people want to say things like, oh, soul winning is peanuts. I don't even care if you're trying to make some greater point, you know, don't ever throw a wet blanket on soul winning. That's the last thing we need right now. You know, there, there, I mean, soul winning is going by the wayside and so many churches, the last thing we need is somebody to stand up and say, well, you know, we could do things differently or it's not that important. It's incredibly important. <clears throat> Because here's the thing, you know, if we're united as a church, right, if we're united as a church and we are helping in the labor, then we're going to, what's that going to lead to? It's going to lead to rejoicing. That's where the real joy is in the Christian life. You know, joy isn't guaranteed in the Christian life. It's something that, you know, I don't, I don't want to say if it's earned, but, you know, there's certain parameters that come with it. There's certain criteria that come with a person having joy. 
Uh, go over to, uh, go to, go back to Philippians chapter 1. The Bible says in Psalms 126, we know this verse, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and, and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again, what? With rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. What brings the joy in the Christian life? It's the labor. It's doing the work of, of preaching the gospel. You know, it, that's where the joy comes from. It's not just um, something that's guaranteed. Bible says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 18, What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or, or in truth, Christ is preached, and therein do I rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. What was Paul rejoicing over? The fact that the gospel was preached. The preaching of the gospel brings rejoicing, not just to the person who gets saved, but to those that preach it. You know, and I, and I know I've mentioned this before, but I'll say it again. People, I've seen people in, in my own self who are just having a bad day, they go out soul and they start knocking on doors. And even if they don't get to preach the gospel, they, they change. It, it just changes your attitude. It gets your mind off your own problems and realizes, you know, it helps you to realize that you're saved. You know, even if you go to some neighborhood where nobody's getting saved, at least you, you should walk away thinking, well, thank God I'm saved. I'm so glad. I mean, there, truly, there are a few that be saved. Like the Bible said, I'm glad I'm one of them. I, you can rejoice in that. Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, a very famous verse, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. He's saying rejoice when? Always. Regardless of circumstances. Now, that's easier to say. It's, it's easier said than done to rejoice always in every set of circumstances. But that's what he said, right? Rejoice always. Remember, Paul said there in Philippians 1.18, that he rejoices that when Christ is preached, whether in pretense or truth, right? Where was Paul writing from? He was writing from prison. But he's saying, but I'm rejoicing. And you know what? I don't think he was just saying that. Paul really was rejoicing. And he, that's why he could tell the Philippians, hey, rejoice always, whether in pretense or, in, you know, in pretense or truth, in good times and bad, you know, you can always rejoice. And that's something I, I think about, you know, I think about with the Lord is, you know, what if we just lost everything? Like Job, just had everything taken away. He just lost everything. What, what, how would that affect our attitude? I mean, I'm sure there'd be mourning, especially, I mean, with Job, you can't, you know, obviously, you, there's mourning that takes place, but there's still joy and ability to rejoice in the fact that you have God. You know, if people, somebody took away everything from you, if you're still saved, you still have a lot to rejoice over. That's why he was able to say rejoice always, no matter what. No matter what your finances are like, no matter what your health is like, no matter what your circumstances are, you have something to rejoice over if you're saved, regardless of circumstance. That's why I said in verse 11, not that I respect and, and speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Pointing out again, that's something that's learned. I have learned to be content. I know both how to be a base and how to abound at everywhere at all things. I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Regardless of circumstance, he was content and he was able to rejoice. Look at verse 5. He said, Let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Now what's he talking about here? He's not talking about your political stance, right? I'm a moderate. He's saying... But he is talking about, in that sense, you know, like what is a moderate, politically speaking? It's somebody who's not on either side to one extreme or the other, right? They're not a, a radical leftist, and they're not extreme right-winger. They're a moderate, right? They're in the middle of the road on a lot of issues. But Paul told us to let our moderation be known unto men, which means this, that we don't want to go to extremes either. And people do this a lot in the Christian life. They get this hyper spirituality and they can go to extremes in their life. And they think it's a good thing because, well, I'm doing it for God, you know. And it's actually not a good thing. The Christian life is about balance, it's about finding balance. Why? Because the Lord is at hand. We should seek to be moderate in the way we live and conduct ourselves and not go above and beyond. Let's go over to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. In Romans chapter 14, we'll see an example of, of, of not going to extremes. Because some people, they'll go to extreme, 
and then they want to bring everybody else over there. Then that's the problem. They'll go to one extreme and they'll say, well, now everyone's got to be like me because I've run to this extreme in my Christian life. He says in Romans chapter 14, look at verse 1, Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. You know, people come in, maybe they're a babe in Christ, and they just have a lot of questions, and, and they're just, maybe they, they, they want to argue finer points of Scripture, or they want to get into some minutia of the Bible and just kind of, you know, just, just kind of float things out there. It's just this kind of, what is it? It's a doubtful disputation. He says, look, receive him, but not to doubtful disputations. You know, they need to learn to not go to those extremes and to just find balance in the Christian life. Focus on what you do know in the Christian life. So many people get so worked up about these, the, the, the hard things that are to be understood in the Bible. You know, and they have, but they haven't even figured out the basics. They haven't even figured out how to live the basics of the Christian life, and they want to go and find some obscure passage and try to delve into it and figure out what it means, misapply it. And they give everybody over, you know, go over. That's all they want to talk about. It's like, why don't you just, you know, we'll receive you in the faith, but not to doubtful disputations. Why don't you grow in just what you do know? Focus on what you do know. Don't run to these extremes. Verse 2, for everyone, uh, believe, for one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let, an, uh, let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him that which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, another man esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be, persuaded, uh, be, be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day uh, to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And then he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, as no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. See, so don't, don't run to these extremes in your Christian life. Why? Because the Lord is at hand. Is at hand. So he says back in Philippians, God sees. Whether we live or die, it's unto the Lord. God sees. Be it, don't go to extremes. Let your moderation be known on the man. The Lord is at hand. You know, we shouldn't worry or concern ourselves over the things that are out of our control. You know, we shouldn't be so worried about another man's servant. You know, to his own master, he's going to rise or fall. And so many people, sometimes they just seem to get so caught up in other people and what they think other people should be doing or what they shouldn't be doing. We shouldn't concern ourselves over things that are out of our control, especially when it comes to other people. Look at verse 6. Be careful for nothing. What is he saying careful there? Just don't use caution, speed, run with scissors. No, he's saying don't worry, right? To not worry. That's, how, that's the Bible word for worry, careful. To be full of care, right? Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request, request be made known unto God. So what's the other thing we're supposed to do here is pray, right? But notice he says there, let, you know, in everything pray, uh, by, in everything by prayer and supplication. You know, and we're real good about that part when it comes to prayer, aren't, it? aren't we? God, I need this. God, I need help with this. We're, a lot of, we're real good at asking. We're really good at making the supplication. But don't forget this other part where it says, with thanksgiving. You know, I think the thanksgiving goes a long way with God. You know, maybe sometimes we should find ourselves just giving God thanks for everything he already has given us. All the supplication and prayers he already has answered. You know, I'm, I've, I mean, I've prayed for people, and I see people start to do things. I've had prayers answered, and I just find myself praying and just saying, well, I forget to even make to, to ask for new prayers or to make new supplications because I'm just busy thanking God. And that's what Paul told us to do, to make prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. I mean, it's the same way with our kids. You know, if they're always asking for something and they never say thanks, you know, we might be a little hes less uh, likely to give them something again, right? The last time I did that for you, there was, you, you know, you didn't seem very grateful there wasn't a whole lot of gratitude there. So I'm not going to do it again for you, right? We want God to answer our prayers. 
You know, we have needs, don't we? We have supplications to make. That's great. There's nothing wrong with that. And he says, you know, we need to ask. To everyone that asketh, uh, receiveth. You know, he, he wants us to go to and, and pray to him and make these re requests. But let's not forget the thanksgiving when God does come through and answer, when God does provide. And he does that every day for things we don't even ask for. God gives us things and provides for us. So don't forget to say thank you when you're praying. <clears throat> and he says in verse 7, if you do this, right, if you're careful for nothing, if you're not worried about everything and you pray with thanksgiving, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So the peace of God which passes all understanding. You can't even wrap your mind around the peace of God. And look, there's Christians, they live their whole life and they never know this peace. And they get so worried and they fret about so many things and they're careful for everything. And the Bible's saying to be careful for nothing. And they never know the peace of God. Do you know it's possible to live your entire Christian life and never know the peace of God? It's possible. And they, they, they bite their nails over every little thing that's going on in the world. And the peace of God which passeth all in our seeing shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. But notice there in verse 7, it starts out with an and, right? Meaning, you know, the prerequisite comes before it. What's the prerequisite? Prayer. And maybe the reason why people don't have the peace with patch, which passeth all understanding is because they're not asking for it, because they're not praying, because they're not making supplication, because they're not giving thanks. They're just busy thinking about everything that's going on in the world, and they have no peace. <clears throat> he says in verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. You know, and that's a great sermon right there. You can just go through those things. But he tells them there to think on those things. You know, and, and this is something, you know, we need to work on too is, you know, getting control of our thought life. Because isn't that, it's kind of all tied together, right? Be careful for nothing, but pray to God with thanksgiving and the peace which passes all understanding shall what keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, he's dealing with the fact that, you know, some people's minds are out of control, out of control with worry, right? Their minds are always racing and always thinking about what could happen, what might happen, or what has happened. They get all caught up in these things. But he says, these are the things that you need to think about. And look, if we're struggling with this, you know, prayer is a big part of it. You know, you need to start there. But the other thing is, you know, you need to get control of your thought life. You need to bring your, your, your mind into subjection. That's what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter, or 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I'll just read it to you. We've read it a few times over the last few weeks. He says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. You know, sometimes that stronghold, we, we always think about, you know, the spiritual strongholds in Tucson, you know, the, the grip that the, the Catholicism has on spiritually on this region. That's a stronghold, right? But we don't often think about the stronghold that's in our own mind. The stronghold that's in our mind, that, that is preventing us from having the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. It says, uh, the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. You know, imaginations that might be in our own hearts, imaginations that might be in our own minds. There are strongholds. And just because we're Christians and we're saved doesn't mean that that can't be there. And every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought. Now, whose thoughts? Our thoughts. Your thoughts. Our own thoughts need to be what? Brought into the captivity, into the obedience of Christ. We need to get control of our minds to think on these things. You know, and this is an exercise that you, you should, you know, you could literally practice. And I remember when I was memorizing this, this verse, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true. I'd say, well, what? Okay, well, let me do that. <laughs> Not just, you know, think about this verse, but let me actually think about whatsoever things are true. You know, if you struggle in your thought life, if you struggle in whatever way in your thought life, you need this verse. You need this verse. If you want the peace that passeth all understanding. If you don't want that, then you know what? This isn't for you, I guess. But I don't know about you, but I do want the peace that which passeth all understanding. It's great. <laughs> 
I want more of it. I don't want to sit and, and live my whole life being careful over every little thing, worried about everything that happens. And look, there's plenty in this world to worry about today, isn't there? I mean, just go turn on the news. That's all they're going to do. It's just, you should worry about this, and you should worry about this, and you need to worry about this. Not to mention the cares of this life that just come through living it. I want the peace that passes all understanding. I have to get control of my mind. How am I going to do that? Through verses like this that tell me to think about whatever so things are true. And I could just sit there and think about things that are true. God's word is true. You know, uh, the gospel is true. Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just. You could just go down this list and dwell on that. If you're struggling with your thought life, you need this verse. And you need to do exactly what it says, to think about these things. Find other verses that back them up. Why? Because, because we're not Buddhists. We're not just going to empty our mind and think about nothing. Right? We're not going to achieve the state of no mind. We're just like, well, I'm just, rather than worrying, I'm just not going to think about anything at all. And just go, oh, oh, and just breathe. That's not going to get you the peace which passes all understanding. That's just going to turn you into some, some numb individual. It's just numb. I don't want to be numb. I want peace. So, well, I'm struggling with these negative thoughts. Well, you need to, you need to push them out, right? But you can't just leave the vacuum there. You have to replace them, right? You have to replace them with positive ones. You have to place them with the things that Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 is talking about. You have to fill that up. Because <clears throat> that's what's going to distract you from the things that are going to make you careful in this life. You know, you need to distract yourself with the Word of God. I mean, it's, you know, sometimes it's just like, just get the social media off your phone, put that thing on do not disturb, turn off the internet and just get your Bible open and just dwell on that. Let yourself be distracted by God's word and what was going to happen, the peace of God, which passes all understanding is what you're going to get. You know, it'll, it'll help you, you know, push out the negativity that's out there and have God's word dwelling in your heart. You know, I try to think of an example of this is like, I do this with God's word to help me through the physical discomfort of physical exercise. <laughs> you know, I've recently started a regiment, you know, of, of exercising. I know everyone's, I'm just as shocked as you are. But, you know, a big part of it is trying to recover your breath. You know, you get your heart rate going and you're, you're sucking air. And, you know, I've, I've been training to, 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 to breathe only through my nose. Hey, you guys are going to Humphreys. Tips right here. Breathe through your nose, not through your mouth, right? I was reading something that they were talking about how there's like uh, there's some kind of a chemical or something that is in your nose that and the way your nose prepares air for your lungs, the way it like it humidifies it, it uh, there's like a certain gas that, that it emits into the air that helps your body absorb oxygen. So you really do want to focus on breathing through your nose. The point is this: I was doing that, and, and look, anyone who's gotten their heart rate up and started really breathing heavy knows how hard, if, especially if you've never been in the habit of breathing through your nose inhaling and exhaling that is that is difficult has anyone ever done it where it, you could feel the friction of the air inside your nose you feel that like the one guy who's like an athlete the one guy who's been sports right yeah it's like it's like well i don't want to do that anymore breathing through my nose like it feels like it's on fire but you got to do it right you got to get through that discomfort you know how i do that through I, I tack a little bible verse on the post outside and i just read that verse and I've been able to just memorize verses and get through that discomfort. I'm just using it as an illustration. Look, the discomfort of life that's affecting you, that's affecting your mind, the things that you're careful for that have you up at night, all the silly little things that the world has you worried about, you need to push them out and, 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 and learn to just meditate on the Word of God and to think about these things, to bring every into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's a tall order. Every thought every thought and he says there at the end of second corinthians 10 and having in readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled so revenge your disobedience you know that's an action it's not just this passive thing you're taking vengeance on your disobedience you're pushing out the negative you're bringing in the word of god you're getting the peace which passes all understanding Meaning this, you have to do something with what you've learned. Do something with what you've learned. 
Those things, he says in verse 9, uh, we'll move on, Philippians chapter 4, verse 9. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen of me, do. Two little letters, do. And the God of peace shall be with you. So he's talking about the peace of God, right? Getting the peace of God. How? Through uh, prayer and supplication, through thinking on these things, and also through what? Through action, through doing. It's not just, you know, it, it, just sitting around and just thinking about all the great things of God. It's actually putting it into action, right? Jesus said, if you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. If you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. So happiness isn't just, well, I know, I know I should be soul winning. I know I should read my Bible. I know I should go to church. I know I should pray. I know I should get this sin out of my life. Great, I'm glad you know it. Now it's time to do it. And if you do that, then you'd be happy. <clears throat> happiness isn't just knowledge. Happiness is the action. Don't you, don't you feel good when you accomplish something? When you do any little thing? I mean, just like the smallest things. Like the other day, I, I dusted the office and vacuumed, which I hadn't done in a month. And I was like, wow, I'm so responsible. I'm such a, I am such a grown adult here. I, I really felt, I really held my head high. Nobody asked me to do it. I just did it. I mean, I knew I needed to do it. I could see the dust. I was sneezing constantly. And I could see the stuff on the carpet. I'm like, well, someone needs to vacuum this office. But that, was, that didn't make me happy, just knowing it needed to be done. Well, at least I know I need to dust. At least I know I need to do whatever. It's the same with us. You know, at least I know I need to get the sin out of my life. At least I know I need to do this or do that. That sure puts a smile on my face. No, it's when you do it. That's what bring the happiness comes. <clears throat> Happier if you do these things. If you do these things. And, you know, we go to James 1 about being doers of the word, not hearers only. We know the chapter. We'll move on, though. The other great thing about verse 9 is I think this is, a, you know, this is like really a sermon I thought about preaching at another time. But he said, you know, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen. Learned, received, heard and seen. And I thought about, this is such a great tip for those that are trying to instruct others. You know, if we're in a position where we're trying to teach other people or bring other people along, you know, this is, these are, these, this is how you instruct people, right? That's what Paul wants. He wants them to do these things, right? <clears throat> so, you know, the people that we're instructing, they don't just learn to do these things by receiving them. And not just by what they've heard or what they, but also what they have seen, you know, and this is a, you know, there's a principle that's out there. It's biblical. Lead by example. Lead by example. I mean, that's really what he's saying here, right? Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and what? Seen in me. I didn't just tell you. I didn't just sit down and write out a formula and say, that's what you need to do. Oh, here, just, you know, let me write your prescription. Let me just give you the instructions. Do this. He said, uh, those things that you have learned and received and what and heard, but most of all, you have seen in me. You know, he led by example. He says in verse 21, and we'll wrap up here. Okay, 21. He says this. Salute every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren which are, uh, are, are with me greet you. Salute every saint. And, you know, this all goes back to this idea of unity in the church again. And really, that's a theme in this chapter. It's a theme in this book. It's a theme in the New Testament that, you know, every saint is worthy of a salutation. Now, don't start saluting people in church. I mean, if you want to, go ahead. You know, but that's not, that's not what he means here. Salute every saint, right? Salute is just like a salutation, a greeting. You know, it's a handshake or a fist bump, you know, or just saying, hi, how are you doing? right? It's just, it's an acknowledging of another person's presence when they come into the room. You know, and if we're not, if we're not careful, we can, we can forget to do this. And look, if somebody does, if some, if you walk in and somebody doesn't say good evening, good morning, hello, you know, maybe they just didn't see you. Maybe their mind's on something. Don't, don't just jump to this instant, you know, you know, just instantly assume, well, they hate my guts. You know, they don't want me here. They don't like me. You know, that, that's not it. Look, I love everyone in this room. Everyone. Okay, everybody, all right? 
but just be, you know, if, if I, if I'm, if I fail to shake your hand or say hello, maybe it's just that I'm thinking about something else. Maybe I've got to turn the camera on or, or try to figure out the song I'm about to sing. Right. And you're like, amen to that. But you know, we should make a point of what saluting every saint saying hello. And you know, I, I hate just preaching these kind of sermons where I'm just kind of all over and just, you know, making just random comments, but that's kind of this chapter. You know, it's just kind of one thing after another. But it just gets me thinking about how, you know, saluting every saint, just saying hello, it's, it's just common courtesy, isn't it? It's just common. You know, common courtesy is a lot less common. It's becoming increasingly less common today, especially in the world, but it should never be said about God's people. I mean, people are becoming so rude today. I mean, just they don't have they just don't have any courtesy, it seems like. It's something that is just being lost. You know, they'll just speed, they'll do 35, 45 through a residential neighborhood that has kids in it. See it all the time. I'm like, you live here. Like, how could you drive like that? You know? You gotta see what's been getting into my crawl, right? You know, people that are just driving too fast, they, they, they don't say thank you, they don't hold doors, it's just all kinds of things that are going by the wayside. <clears throat> but here's one that should never go by the wayside, especially in God's house, is you should salute every saint and make a point of, of saying hi. Maybe not, you can't get to somebody every time. I understand the churches get bigger, it's harder to get around and see everybody, but it should never just be like, hey, how you doing? <sighs> or I'll shake your hand and I'll shake your hand. I'll, you know, I'll shake your hand. That's not a Christian attitude. That should never take place. Every saint is worthy of salutation, even the ones maybe you don't like. Is it, is it possible that maybe in a group where we have people getting saved from all different walks of life, all different backgrounds and coming together in the, in the house of God, that just maybe there'll be somebody who you have a personality conflict with? Sure, it's bound to happen. Now, I like and love everybody here, but I've been in bigger churches where I can't say that. Right? There's some people I'm just kind of like, I still salute them. You know, I still shake their hand. I say hello, but I just think, I'm never having you over for dinner. You know, I'd still, hey, if you need me to come change a car tire or give you a jump or help you move, I'll be there. It's my Christian duty. I love you as a brother, but, you know, our personalities are so far, our, 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 our humor is so different. You know, we don't see eye to eye. You know, that's going to happen. You know, and if it hasn't happened here already amongst you, just give it time. It will. Eventually, somebody will come along that is just not going to be someone you can get along with out, you know, outside of church. And that, there's nothing wrong with that. That's okay. But you at least have to have the common courtesy to shake someone's hand, and, and not just because the, the preacher said to do it, because that, it's salute every saint. Saint. Okay? And what is a saint? It's a child of God. So whether I like them or not, Christ loves them and died for them, and therefore I will salute them. I will shake their hand and say good morning, say good evening, and be courteous and kind and polite. And not think about it, you know, but I, that doesn't mean I have to take them out to lunch or have them, whatever. But I at least have to acknowledge the fact that that is a, a saint for whom Christ died. I might as well, you know, that's a brother in Christ, that's a sister in Christ. That somebody can do great things for God, with or without me, I might as well just take the time to salute him. And this is kind of the theme that's been throughout the whole book, is how we treat others. How we treat others. We, this chapter, this book, if you've noticed, there's a lot about treating others appropriately, isn't there? He says at the end here, to salute every saint. Remember earlier in the book, hold, he's supposed of, a, 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 a Paphrodite, not a Paphrodite, Ah. Can't believe I'm forgetting it. We got to go there. <laughs> you, you, oh man, huh? Eodius, thank you. Is it Eodius? Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. We got to get there. It's gonna bug me if I don't say it.
No, 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 no. There it is. I'm going to find it. Epaphroditus. It's one of those names, folks. I could see the E, and I could see the U, and I could see the PH, and it was just like, oh. Epaphroditus, right? Well, now what did he say about Epaphroditus? To hold such a reputation. What did he say about Timothy? You know the proof of him. He's saying, look, remember we talked about there's some people that would be worthy uh, to, to know them which labor among you. I mean, it's all throughout Paul's writings. You know, uh, esteem them very highly in, their, uh, in love for, the, for their work. And, uh, you know, to, to, to submit to them that have the rule over you. Look, a big theme throughout Philippians is the fact that we should treat people appropriately. That we are to mind the same rule. Remember how we are all supposed to mind the same rule. We should be of the same mind. We should let our moderation be known to all men. We should help those who labor. We should what? Salute every saint. You know, we should care about the way we behave ourselves towards one another. And we should never, you know, snub a saint. Don't ever do that. The Bible says in Romans 12, be, kind, be kindly affectionate, affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. That's the Christian attitude that we ought to have towards our brethren. And I want to close on this last point, is that, you know, we need to uh, make sure we conduct ourselves towards people properly. And of course, you know, the saluting of every saint, just the common courtesy, that's pretty basic, right? And we would all, most people would agree with that. But another thing that kind of slips by people is this idea that they don't have to remain impartial when it comes to judging people. Because, look, we're going to have to judge in the local church. You know, especially if you're in a position of authority, people are going to come to you with things and say, hey, this person said or did this, and we need to address it. That kind of thing happens. And a lot of times they come to you and they say, hey, so-and-so said this, I think they're a wicked reprobate and we need to kick them out. It's like, well, whoa there, Turbo. <laughs> Just cool your jets a little bit, all right? And I look, I've had that happen more than... I, I've lost count how many times that type of thing has happened. Or maybe they're not just saying those exact words, they're a wicked reprobate, need to go, but just like, you know, well, I mean, obviously they must be some kind of, you know, infiltrator if they would say something that stupid or whatever. You know, or, or they just, people just have it, get it, they just get it in their minds that somebody is something and then they just have it out for them. And it's not right. The Bible says we're to be affectionately, uh, be, be kindly affectioned one to another. And the Bible says in 1 Timothy, I charge thee before God, 1 Timothy 5, and the Lord Jesus and the elect angels, that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. Paul charged Timothy with that before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels. He's saying, I'm calling God and Jesus and all the elect angels to witness with you, Timothy. I'm going to lay this charge. This is something you need to do in the house of God that I observe these things, the things that are written in the Bible, uphold the word of God, to, you know, to, to not back down, to stand, you know, to be, to stand fast in the faith, but to not, to, that, that not to observe these things with what? Preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. You know, meaning you have to have discernment and judgment. You can't just say, well, I know the Bible says we should, you know, kick this person out for being a drunk, but I really like them, you know? But they're my friend. So, no, sorry, the Bible says you have to do that. Or not, you know, oh, I, this, I, I heard this person had a beer in their fridge. Now they're gone because I don't like them. That's impartiality. That's not being impartial. That's being partial. That's not, that's preferring one above another. You know, and I'm just using that as an example. And, and, and people get carried away with this. They, want, they come to you and they're like, Oh, you, you know, they said this or whatever. And even and here's the thing. Sometimes will pe people do say things that are concerning. They do say things that kind of make you wonder, like, hmm, that is kind of a weird thing to say. You know, but people forget that sometimes people just say things because they're ignorant, because they just say things because they're in the flesh. And they have to be given a chance to, to correct that and to grow out of that. Just because they say something odd or off-color you know, or that's concerning, that, that does not instantly mean that there's some reprobate worthy of death or something, or they need to just be excommunicated from the church immediately. I usually say, well, you need to go talk to that person and, and ask them to clarify it. 
And when people struggle with this, this is how I always bring them back down to earth. I say, well, let's say somebody came to me and said the same thing about you. How would you want me to handle it? Would you want me to be impartial? Well, yeah. Okay, then. <laughs> that's what we're doing here. You know, that's what I would hope. I would hope that if somebody said, you know, they, if I said or did something that caused concern where the people had to go to talk to somebody about it, you know, that they would be impartial about it. That they would, they would give me the what? The benefit of the doubt. The benefit of doubt. Because there's that chance that, you know what? They just said something that was wrong. You know, they're just mixed up. They need to grow. We can't just, you know, just be standing there ready to just execute people and just chop off their heads over every little thing. You have to, what? You have to be impartial. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 6, If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. It take, you know, that's, it, that's a sign of spiritual maturity, of spiritual growth, when a person can come to the place of realizing this. You know, that, hey, just because somebody said or did something weird doesn't mean that they're X, Y, and Z, and that we need to, you know, give them a chance to grow out of that and, you know, find out why. <clears throat> Maybe they're just in the flesh, whatever, who knows. He says, if a man be overtaken in fault, you which are spirit will restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, what? Considering thyself. Considering thyself. Look, if I ever said or did something weird, I would want people to give me the benefit of the doubt and allow me to clarify it, not just instantly label me something and, you know, toss me in the trash can. And people get this attitude. I'm telling you, it's out there. Just they don't like something somebody did or said. It's like, just throw them in the trash can now. Can we just get rid of them? No. Even if I, even if I would say in the back of my mind, say, you know what, I don't like that person either. I still can't be that way because the Bible says to be remain impartial, to not be a respecter of persons. And look, if you're gonna ever gonna be in a position of leadership or authority, you have to have this principle down because you will you can you have that power and you could destroy people who don't need to be destroyed. You can discourage people who have no business being discouraged. You can hurt people who have no business being hurt. If you go into everything, you know, with partiality, with preference, with being a respecter of persons, you can do a lot of damage that way. You know, either way, you know, maybe, maybe you have to deal with something. And, uh, you know, you don't want to, but you have to. So always ask yourself this, you know, when you, want somebody, when you want somebody to deal with somebody, you know, maybe this is foreign to a lot of people, I don't know, but if you've ever been a supervisor of or overseen things, you know, people, you're the one that people come to with problems. And someone comes, you say, yeah, you need to do something about this. You know, always ask yourself, how would you like to be treated? You know, maybe even if you do have to go do something about it, the manner in which you go about doing it. How would you like to be treated? Consider yourself, lest you also be tempted. So you see in Philippians, you know, there's a lot of practical application about, you know, how we ought to just interact and treat one another. And, you know, showing common courtesy and, and, and using discernment and all these things. And, uh, you know, it's something that we need to work on, you know, and always keep in mind. You know, maybe it's something we've got down, but don't ever let that slip. That fact that, you know, People here are God's children, you know, and they deserve to be treated with respect. They deserve to be treated kindly. And, you know, if there ever is an issue, you know, we should always go into it hoping for the best, hoping for the best. You know, I, I've had, you know, I'm, people come to me and say, well, so-and-so said this or did this, and I got this weird whatever, this text or something, and what I, should I do about it? Well, let's just hope that it's not what you think. Let's, let's hope it's not the worst. Let's hope it's just them being stupid. That should, that's not just like, oh, I hope this guy turns out to be some vile reprobate that we get to just, that's a wrong attitude. That's just like, it's you being a drama queen. That's what that is at the end of the day. You just love to see conflict and drama. You know, look, there's going to be conflict and drama. You can't avoid it. But you don't have to salivate every time you see any potential for it. And, and, and how do you avoid that? By treating other people well by being impartial and, you know, saluting and loving and being kindly affectionate one to another. Let's go ahead and pray.